Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this week's Sabbath school study. As we continue to progress, as we go in now to Zechariah chapter 8, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and for his wisdom so that we might be able to more properly divide the word of truth and be prepared for the lessons that he would look to teach us? Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the ministry of the Comforter. We thank you that the Holy Spirit can open our minds to convict us of sin, reveal to us what it means to be righteous, and prepare us for the judgment. Help us so that we may progress from sanctification, excuse me, from justification to sanctification to judgment, and know what it means to truly walk in the path that you would have us to walk. I thank you, Father, for those that have joined us this morning. I thank you for those that are not able to join us. Direct us now. Please guide us and show us, Father, what we need to understand at this time in our history. May your angels be with us. Help us now so that we may rely totally on you and not upon any man. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, we have a situation. We are currently working through the book of Zechariah, and we are now in Zechariah chapter 8. The headings that the translators had used for the different sections are as follows. Verse 1 addresses the restoration of Jerusalem. Verse 9, the people are encouraged to build the temple by a promise of God's blessing. 16, Truth and justice are required of them. Verse 18, joy and enlargement of the church is promised. Are we to take this literally at this time? Or are we to approach this symbolically, figuratively, spiritually? Well, you you mean literally like the restoration of Jerusalem? And the building of the temple. Well, I mean, those are going to occur while they and then we see so Zechariah he's actually addressing the building of the temple so literally it was built but obviously it has uh, uh, symbolic uh, implications my question and and I'm, I'm using this from a lot of what other parties would be presenting at this time is a third temple to be built no now, people sometimes get that from Ezekiel, right? So so they're going to, you know, Ezekiel talks about a temple, which we studied in detail. Uh, right. But we know that it, it's symbolic, not literal in that case. This one, of course, is talking about a literal temple, but that was built. But still, its implications for us today are about a symbolic temple, not a literal ch- temple. Right. And, and of course, if you, you had a literal temple, then you would have to have a completely different soteriology. That is how salvation works. You would have to have a completely different understanding of what the purpose of the sanctuary was, what Christ's death on the cross meant, because it would sort of be a denial of Jesus' death on the cross. Right. That God is going to have another literal temple built again, where animal sacrifices are going to be offered. But, you know, some people, you know, they tend to be concrete, literalistic in their thinking just in general. Some people have a hard time with understanding symbolism. I would agree. <clears throat> now here, Zechariah begins. And again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Three times we have jealous or jealousy. Are they three different words? Are they two different words? How do we see this? Well, I mean, they're, the jealous is one word, jealousy is another word, but they're basically the same Hebrew word, just in a different form. Okay. Kina for jealousy, Kana for uh, jealous. 
kind of interesting. Okay. It's basically a vowel pointing and then uh, jealousy has a, a hat at the end, the letter H, right? So. so are we dealing here again, since we have a repeat of Hebrews 7065, are we dealing with the second angel's message again? I wouldn't in this case. Okay. Um, I don't think that that's, I mean, I'm, I'm saying, you know, like in Hebrew, they do repeat words. Um, every time we see it, we'd have to have some reason if we're going to say that this is the second angel's message, not just that there's words repeated. I mean, it could, I mean, it could apply to the second angel's message, but you'd have to have more than that. Now, I'm thinking about, excuse me, um, for Zechariah 8, 2, I'm thinking where Christ said, the zeal of my father's house house has eaten me up so there is a zeal there about his fervency in trying to upbuild a spiritual temple as well as cleanse the physical temple because the cleansing of the physical temple was just an illustration of what we should be going through cleansing the spiritual temple and yes he does have great zeal for both yeah now, the word zeal and the word jealous uh, they're the same hebrew word but we we often don't really think of them as the same word. Well, in I've learned to because I found out they are derived from the same Hebrew word. Yeah. And now the two different jealous and zeal, they, they're still related even in English. But, you know, we, we see them as two different words. They've come to diverge to mean two different things, but they mean the same thing. So just a note on that, because in Psalm 69, 9, for the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And the reproaches of them that reproached thee are fallen upon me. And we looked at that word reproach before, right, when we were studying Daniel chapter 11. Right. Right. Dealing with uh, that is a reference to to Christ in Daniel 11. And we probably should have looked at this verse. But that word reproach or the reproaches, 2781. So it's got uh, 18th of July 20 backwards, if you wanted to look at it that way. And we addressed that before. So anyway, that's just a note. Now, the translators would have given reference from this verse to Nahum 1 verse 2, which reads, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Jealousy to revenge to vengeance. Uh, well, revenge and vengeance are basically just one is a noun and one is a verb. But Because revengeth, of course, is a, a verb, and, reven and vengeance itself is a noun. Okay. But, but there's basically the same word. But jealous, of course, is different. And in this case, in name one verse two, it, it's, it's a related word, but it's not exactly the same Hebrew word. Okay. It's related. It means to be jealous. In this case, jealous or angry. They also give reference back to Zechariah 1.14. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, cry thou saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. Mm -hmm. What is Zechariah pointing to? He's pointing to Zion. He's pointing to Jerusalem. Is he, in figurative language, addressing the people of God in the last days? Well, I mean, he's addressing the fact that the temple has been destroyed. Right. right? So, so this is about the restoration of the temple, literally in that context, right? Uh, that's why Jerusalem and Zion, Mount Zion, where the temple would be. So, I mean, the parallel to our time would be what? Obviously, we're not dealing with an actual temple. God's not going to rebuild another temple. So what would that be referencing that he's jealous for? Is he jealous for the temple that will be built with living stones. Okay, but yeah, that's not kind of the question I'm asking. Okay. 
So the question is, Jerusalem doesn't have a temple. Right. What is that paralleling in our time? Now, we could say, you know, there isn't this church. But but to understand what that means in the context of Jerusalem and how does that relate? In, in a sense, it's kind of related to what you're saying, but there's... Uh, I don't know how to word the question without giving the answer, but. Well, there are those that would say that God is jealous for the, quote, apple of his eye, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay. Um, so, so the purpose of the temple was so that God could commune with his people. Correct. Right. That, that's really the, pur- the purpose of the temple. I mean, it symbol- symbolizes that communion with God. It was the access to God that they had because they were sinners and God is holy. The only access that we could have to God in a symbolic sense was through the temple. Obviously, any person could pray to God and talk to God, but it was symbolizing that separation that exists between God and man, even from the symbolism of the first offering of the lamb, right? Because Adam and Eve hid themselves, big leaves, right? You know, um, and then, you know, God had a lamb be killed and then they were clothed with lamb skin to cover their nakedness, symbolizing uh, two different ways of justification. One was to to hide from God, to justify ourselves. The other was to have a substitute. Right. Right. The Christ that lamb represents the bridging between sinful man. So man doesn't have to hide in the darkness. Because of Christ, we can come into communion with God. And so the sacrifice symbolizes that communion with God that we can have, even though we are sinners. So I'm focusing here more that this is about the proclamation of the gospel, if that makes sense. Because the purpose of Jerusalem and the temple is this access to God. And that is the thing that is missing in the last days. Sure, God is building a temple which is his people that is going to give this access to God. Right. Okay. Correct. That is, we, we, we give the gospel, but the focus here, the jealousy is about the lack of the gospel, the lack of contact with God. So God is jealous in the sense that he has this purpose in restoring the image of God in man. And and that's going to be through a proclamation of the gospel. All right. All right. You can see that in the next verse. Okay. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. So that's the purpose why God is is working at this time. God wants to dwell in the midst of his people so that he can he can have people drawn to him. Right? It shall be called the city of truth. We need to be called the city of truth. That is we need to represent God in everything that we do to draw people to God. Does that make sense? How I'm looking at this. I don't know if people agree with me or not. That's what I'm seeing too. Okay. Now, in this, in dwelling in the midst of Jerusalem, Isaiah, or excuse me, Zechariah 2, verse 10 tells us, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. So this gives some support to what you're saying. But in this, in, in calling this the city of truth, Isaiah 121 tells us, How is the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Isaiah 126. And I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. How can the city, how can Jerusalem become a harlot? How can it be full of judgment and yet righteousness lodge in it? If righteousness is lodging in it, 
how can murderers be within? There is a cleansing that is to take place in order for the people to become God's people. Because this, <clears throat> this is not talking about some figurative city. Is this chapter not talking about us? Yes, it is. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the alternate, thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for a multitude of days. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts. So this Hebrew word, marvelous, is it better translated hard or difficult? How do we see this? How should we approach this? What I mean marvelous in what way? Like, uh, like, what are you trying to ask about the meaning of the word? Yes, Hebrew six three eight one, which gives us the digits for eighteen sixty three. Paul Law. Okay. Yeah, because we we connect this with the wonderful number, right? Right. Because Palmoni that has this as the root, right? The Paul part, Moni referring to the number part, right? Right. So is that what you're trying to get at, the connection to the wonderful number? Okay, at this point, I have multiple times when I am trying to share some of these things with people that I'm being told, it's great that you like numbers so much, but why aren't you speaking of the love of Jesus? Numbers don't talk to me about Jesus. And you're making it too difficult. So thus saith the Lord of hosts, if it be difficult in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be difficult in my eyes? Saith the Lord of hosts. The wonderful number is giving us way marks. He's giving us symbols all throughout scripture so that we may understand more and more that which is necessary for us to know at this time. Yeah. So if you're saying it, 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 you, I'm making it too hard, um, should I just give up on, on the things that are hard? Cause what I have to do is hard. Is that how you would put it then? Isn't that kind of how the verse is saying it? Yeah. Now, and, and the thing about, of course, when people say that about numbers, they say, well, why are they in the Bible? Right. You know, why, why is the Bible full of numbers, of dates, of spans of times, of time prophecies, um, if they have nothing to do with the gospel? But, yeah, so this, that's kind of an interesting perspective. You know, because we can connect this to the wonderful number uh, as well, but also just the sense that something – so when we think about the wonderful number, we could basically say it's like the difficult to understand number, because that's one way that this word can be translated. Right. Right. It can be translated as to be difficult to understand. Now, there are different forms of the Hebrew word, right? what they call the nithal form, the PL form, the hithal form. But this is not in the PL form, which just means uh, to separate as in an offering. This is in a form that means hard or extraordinary or hard or difficult thing. It can mean that. I, I'm just going to look exactly at what uh, this uh, says here. Yeah, because because that is really what it's saying. You know, if, it, if it's so difficult for you, if I'm too, too difficult, like, you obviously are being difficult. <laughs> well, I'm being totally difficult. I know this. No, but I mean, you know, God's being difficult, right? You know, and, and we're being difficult. So so how are we going to respond to this difficult part of things? Right. You're asking to help us enlighten. 
enlighten our minds and give us the perseverance to continue. Like Ellen White said, we should be taxing our brains. And it is very brain taxing, but it's rewarding. Okay, so, okay, it's interesting. Okay. Yeah, so it's in the NIFAL form, third person masculine sing singular. So in that definition of the word, you know, it's it means uh, to be difficult to understand, right? Or beyond one's power uh, to understand. Now, what's being difficult to understand here? What is what is the difficulty that God is pointing to for them? Is it that God is going to do this work? I would have to agree. Hmm. Now, here, you know, when we, when we're looking at this. When we look and we use the rule of first mention, comparing this line upon line, we would have to go back to Genesis 18, 14. Here we're asking a question. We're seeing this question presented. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Okay. Yeah, so that's the... Uh that same word, too hard, right? Correct. Okay. Six, six, three, eight, one. Now, in these situations, as we look at this verse, I'm being reminded of how Rebecca came to Jacob. Here is Jacob, a man that we would call elderly. And his mother says to him to put skins on your arms to emulate your twin brother Esau. Take in this bowl, this food, and present it to your father so that your father will bless you. Now, was Rebecca's direction to Jacob in keeping with God doing his will in the situation no in the situation with sarai abram and hagar was sarai's intervention telling abram to take hagar as a concubine was that according to the way that god had stated that he would work no in these cases Rebecca and Sarai were interposing themselves in place of God, saying that this is too hard for God to do, that God is unable to do his work. He's unable to do what he promises. He is unable to do that which he has said he would do and for which we have prayed. Is this the condition we find ourselves in today? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Yeah, well, we, we put lots of things is too hard for God, uh, but we try to put the problem is us. So I can't overcome sin uh, in my life. But that's obviously too hard for us, but it's not too hard for God. Right. Right. So, but sometimes people doubt the power of God to to actually change our hearts and and to accomplish the work that has to be done in the last days. I mean, I, I struggle over you know what is it that my responsibility is to to this message because I believe it's a very precious message, and you know people need to hear of it. But God has His way in which He's going to have it propagated, and. And the focus has to be upon us developing a Christ-like character. People could argue, well, you just need to start, you know, making more videos or making better videos and publishing and, and agitating, you know, within the church itself to get people to hear it and so forth. But that would be man's way, not God's way. God has to open things up. So we, we seek to do what God wants and we ask him to accomplish the work. But we have to be willing to do our part as he opens it up. But we can't run ahead of him. You know, I listened last night to Kelly's testimony. Mm -hmm. 
And I can appreciate a lot of what he had to say. In this situation, let us remember that if anything is too hard for the Lord, where the question is being asked, is there anything that is too hard for Jehovah? In Exodus 3, verse 20, it is said, I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, with all my marvelous things, with all my difficult things, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. For generations, the Philistines, the Amorites, the Amalekites, all of these nations around Israel spoke of the power of Jehovah. How many times do we pray for things? And yet, do how many times do we forget to thank him as we pray for hearing and answering our prayer? I've seen that a lot. I've seen it a lot. And I've done it too. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'll give you a uh, I'll give you a testimony of my own from this week. I received a telephone call from Jennifer, absolutely, totally, emotionally upset because her son was having to suffer through kidney stones. He was having these problems, and he lives down in Portland. Over the last several months, when he has gone to the hospital, it's become a situation of, well, you'll just need to wait. We'll get you in where we can get you there. She was distraught. We took time for prayer. As we prayed, as we asked for God's guidance and his direction in this matter, as the request was made, I closed the prayer, thanking our Heavenly Father for not only hearing the prayer, but for answering the prayer. Now, the normal human reaction would be, well, we'll see. It shocked her that within 30 minutes, 30 minutes, the time that it took for her son to be driven to a hospital, not only was he in the hospital, but he was placed into a room for them to do the examination. Now, this was a huge change from what, what had occurred just a few months ago. Yet, a reminder had to be given that not only had this prayer been heard, but, had, but it had been answered before we even finished the prayer. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Becomes the question that we're going to need at this time. Our Heavenly Father is taking this work into his hands. If nothing is too hard for him, what's going to stop this message from going forward? Only our own attitudes can hinder this message from going forward. Um, Amen. I would suggest that her son try Spearman T, like research everything he can to bust the kidney stones. That's what I would be doing because I have almost absolutely no faith in the medical system as I, it is today. I, I agree. I have no faith in it whatsoever. I have faith in it like if there's an EMS team and they're reviving somebody or something like that. But apart from that, nope. Thank you for your input. That's greatly appreciated. Hey, Dwight. Yes, brother. Um, also, did that um, what he's going to go through, whether we have a attitude or not, because he's going to leave us behind if we ain't got him out. Is that right? I, brother, I'll be honest. Your your vocal was coming through very garbled. I don't know why. Yeah, I couldn't understand it. But... Okay. I, I was saying that whether our attitudes are right or not, he'll leave us behind, but it's going to go forward whether we got our attitudes right or not. I agree with you. 
That's a very astute observation and a very correct observation. Now, Zechariah 8, 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. Or as the alternate Hebrew would be, I will save my people from the east country and from the country of the going down of the sun. Several times in Psalms, this becomes referenced. And then Malachi 111. For from the rising of the sun, even until the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. Why are his people being saved from the East country and from the West? The East, I would have to think, is giving a reference to Islam. But what would the West be? Yeah, so I wouldn't here put this as Islam. But I don't think that's that we can do that here. Okay. How would you approach it? Well, I mean, the simple expression of the idiom, idiom is just from East to West in the direction that the sun goes, right? So, yeah, I'm not quite sure why the King James... Now, now we do have, of course, that word country, which is the Hebrew word 776, which refers to the land, Eretz, right? Okay. Being translated here as country. But this isn't referring to things east of Israel or west of Israel. It's referring to the land of Israel, the east part, and the west part. All right. Right? So so it's not something that comes from the east, such as Islam, but it, it's referring to the land of Israel. Now, often they talk about from Dan even to Beersheba, which is uh, dealing with the north and the south. But here he's going to use east and west which is in the path in which the sun travels, right? And and then, so the word west there is, is actually uh, the entrance of the sun. Now, we, we think, well, when the sun sets in the west, how is that an entrance? Wouldn't that be the exit? You would think, so. what? Think, it'd be, think it'd be the exit. Yeah, but but the thing is, it's it's still the the idea of that word uh, three nine nine six, uh, mabo uh, means entrance and where where the sun goes right. So so we have these two parts of the land of Israel being described in this way regarding the, the, the sun Sorry. travel. Yeah, I was gonna say sundown would be the uh, beginning of a new day. Yeah, but that's not why they call it an entrance. It's just that there's the sun goes in a sense through an entrance when it leaves. It, it's entering somewhere else. That's just the way that the Hebrew expression would would address it. We wouldn't probably do that. Like we talk about the going down of the sun, but they didn't really talk about the going down in the same way that we do, right? So the entrance of the sun. So the sun's entering somewhere. It's going somewhere. It's entering. It's not really leaving, if that makes sense. <laughs> and then, uh, and, and the word east is the word sunrise. So in both cases, this is referring to the sunrise and the sunset, the land, the part of the land where the sun rises and the part of the land where the sun sets. It right. And Jesus, and Jesus was, sorry, I'm just going to say it reminds me when Christ said that he was going away and yet I will send a comforter to you. Like he wasn't really departing from them except physically. Just like yeah. the sun doesn't really depart when it seems to be setting. Yeah. Now, now the main thing is, you know, the coming of Christ is from the east and to the west, right? As in the path of the sun. So. All right. Anyway, that's my argument for why it's not referring to places outside of the land of Israel. Okay. And I that, that mean, you accept that, Dwight? You accept my argument? I, I accept your presentation of it. <laughs> okay. 
Do you accept you accept the conclusion then? Right. Okay. Okay, good. And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. What does this what does this mean for us? Okay, and just another thing going back to the previous verse, because what? when he says, Behold, I will save my people from sure. the evil part of the land from the west part of the land right that word save means free right okay right so he's going to free or help them or aid them now can refer to defending delivering rescuing right that type of idea but it, it comes from a word that means to be open wide or free um and then he's going to bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. So my people, Ami, right, in Hebrew. Am is people, Ami means my people. So in, in this context, because remember, this is about the immediate context is the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. So this is about taking God's people and bringing them to Jerusalem to this newly constructed temple, right? That they're going to come and worship him. Does that make sense? That you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, this is about God revealing his character through his people in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem becomes the center. It becomes this symbol that draws all, all these people to him. So instead of passively waiting for this miraculous, fantastic pouring out of the latter rain, shouldn't we, because this is what I've heard in the mainstream church, shouldn't we be actively cooperating with God so that he can pour out the latter rain? Well, to actively cooperate in what way? So um, obviously the... It, it might again seem passive because we are asking, I know I am asking the Lord to clear out all the rubbish within mm. and to uh, yield more to him. You wonder why I'm going through trials and battles? Because this is the determination I have because I want to be fit for heaven. I want to be a fit vessel so I can reach other people. Like sometimes I'm late for class because people are on the phone or they're Facebooking me inquiring about stuff it's really amazing me yeah well okay so you know if we're if we're dealing with um you know the latter rain now the latter rain is we have the former rain and the latter rain right the former rain comes after the planting of crops in the fall late fall right you plant the crops you have the rain in december Right, that's the former rain. And then you have the latter rain in the spring, which has to do with the ripening of the grain. So before the grain ripens, there's going to be this rain in the spring. And then and then you're going to have the heat and then, you know, the grain will ripen and be full. Right. That's that's the former and latter rain. So what has to happen? What is the latter rain? What is its purpose? Spiritually speaking. Well, that, that is to fall before Christ comes. Like we have to be ripened spiritually for his coming. But I heard it over and over when I was a, I was attending mainstream churches. We're waiting for the latter rain. We're praying for the latter rain. But nobody would define what the latter rain really entailed. Well, we know it's a message. Right. Right. But, but they what... didn't know it. It was like they were waiting for some magical power. You know, and I'm thinking, what are you talking like? What are you in the church? I would say the church in its present condition is not fit for any any ex, uh, experience like that. Like how are this is what I went through in 2013. It all came to a head. I thought I am a mess. The church is impossible. How is this going to happen? How is Christ even going to return in our lifetime? Because they were saying that, too. He's going to come in our lifetime. Well, how? And now I'm learning how it can be possible. I mean, Lord, help us all to be ready for him. You know? Like it's a real purging. It's a real scourging. But he says that he scourges those he loves. 
So we shouldn't be surprised if, if we're going through heavy, heavy trials right now. They're only going to get heavier if we remain faithful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is the thing in the upper room studies that, um, you know, people were talking about, like, the latter rain. And, you know, we would pray for the latter rain. You know, I'm not really a, um, definitely not a Pentecostal in, in that sense. So I, I wasn't looking for something, you know, magical to happen. You know, I, I understood from studying the spirit of prophecy that, that this was, um, I, I don't know if I would have worded it that was a message, but it was definitely not just something that was going to happen apart from us receiving it, right? Like that is there, there had to be something that we have to do not just praying for something, you know, magical to happen, but actually participating with God in some way, right, in order for that to happen. I didn't mu understand much back then. But, you know, as as we, we look at what we have been doing in studying God's word, you know, that's the preparation for the latter rain, because we're preparing our hearts to receive that rain, right? There's there's a work that has to be done first. You have to plant the seed. Well, first you, you prepare the soil. You plant the seed. You have spiritual growth that happens. And then at the end, just before the harvest, you receive this outpouring of the latter rain. But if all of the other stuff is not done, is the latter rain going to do any benefit? If I haven't prepared the soil and I haven't planted any crop, is the latter rain going to do anything other than make maybe a field full of mud? I don't know if that's the best. <laughs> maybe that's why we're having heavy rain and floods in some places now. It's an illustration. <laughs> we need to be ready spiritually. Well, if the ground is hard, the water just runs off, right? So, so we have to be able to receive what God wants to give us. And there's a message you know, um, sort of an ironic story. I remember uh, Greg Sharman preaching in Warburg Church a few years ago, talking about how, you know, the people that are going to come and present the message from God, you know, we're not going to receive them. And this is at a time when they were rejecting everything I was saying about the 2520. <laughs> and, uh, and I wasn't really saying much about it. I mean, I wasn't like, preaching it in the church or anything. They just knew what my stand was. But, you know, they basically had someone in their midst who was presenting the message that they needed to heed, and they weren't recognizing it. And and so, you know, he was, in a sense, being prophetic in, in recognizing that this, this would happen. So, you know, we're not ready to receive the message. So the latter rain can't be poured out. And so what we see here is that God is going to make a promise of something he's going to do. And and do we believe that he's going to do it? And are we going to be be a part of it when it happens? Okay, Dwight, we, we got oh, like... God so. helping us, we'll all be a part of it. You know, I'm thinking about Christ said too. A prophet hath no honor in his own country. You know, among his own people. He came unto his own, like we can't come upon... The SDA church or whatever, and his own received him not. Can we expect the same? That's why I said it's going to take a terrible catastrophe for enough people to take a stand and say, no, we're not going along with the majority, following the Pope, receiving the mark of the beast. We need to turn to these people who do have a message because God has been showing us glimpses of the same thing, and this is confirming it. This is what I see. This is the only thing that's going to save the true remnant church. They're always saying, we're the remnant, we're the remnant. Well, <laughs> I believe some of them are or will be. Well, yeah, so the one thing we can say about that is many Adventists know the truth in a certain sense, right? They know about the Sabbath and the Sunday, and they know about the, the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast and all those types of things. But those things aren't going to save them, right? It's the knowledge of God that's going to save them. Right, knowing God. Anyway, Dwight, our, our time is almost up here. I don't know if right. you, if you can sum this up or something. Okay, we will be returning to these verses this next week. So I don't think we're, we're even halfway finished with what we need to address here. Mm -hmm. 
Any other comments or thoughts? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, as the latter rain is falling all around us, many are not aware and how this rain has been being sent since the warning in September of 2001. Help our hearts to be ready. Prepare us, Father, for that that you would have done. Help us to desire to walk in the light and not in darkness. Help us to praise you in all things. Even when things look difficult, even when things look hard and harsh, Help us to maintain a spirit of gratitude and of joy. Be with us now. Guide us in all things. May your will be done. For this, Father, we ask, we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.